We are in 1 Samuel today, chapter 2. I kept being discombobulated this week when I was trying to tell the ladies what passage was. I had 2 Samuel 1, then I had 2, I don't know what all I had. They finally sorted it out and I straightened it out. But we're in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, talking about Hannah, wonderful Uh, example of motherhood in our Bible. Follow along with me as we read. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord my horn is lifted up. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bowels of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for full food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was born barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and rises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundation of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That song that Hannah shared there in her joy was probably one used for other occasions and she appropriated it because it spoke to her. Much like when we're having a joyful time and beautiful day, we may sing, He Keeps Me Singing, or some other song that we love. And so today we celebrate our mothers, and we celebrate the women in our lives. I've known many, many who have been a blessing to me, even though I wasn't their son. They nurtured me, taught me, trained me, encouraged me. Now the subject of our message today, Hannah, as far as we know, was just like every woman. She loved, she was loved, she laughed, she felt joy, she cried, and she felt pain. In Hannah's case, that particular pain was the inability to bear children. As far as we can tell, everything else about her life was good. She had a husband who loved her, provided for her. He was a man of some means. But because he was so good, I think it weighed even more in Hannah's mind that she could not give him a son, a child that he desired. Hannah was one of two wives. The other wife's name was Penina. Elkanah was the husband. And let me digress here for a minute and say that just because we have the story in the Bible where it seems like we're putting forth this, this family of faith It doesn't mean that God agreed with multiple wives. That wasn't his design. But that is one of the truths of the Bible is it doesn't sugarcoat God's people. It tells us in all our warts and ways that are against God and for God to teach us about him. Scholars believe that Hannah was his first wife, the woman that Elkanah fell in love with, But probably when they learned Hannah couldn't have children, he took another wife, Penina. Penina bore Elkanah children, and she wasted no time ridiculing Hannah because she couldn't have them. I'm reading between the lines now. It doesn't say this in our scripture. But knowing some human nature, I'd suspect one reason Penina was so harsh and mean towards Hannah was because she knew that Elkanah truly loved Hannah. And in a way, she was the utility wife, the one to bring and bear children. Children 
were so crucial in those days and even in the early days of our country. Many of you are from large families and you had them on the farm to help, to work. They were necessary. And so I just have a suspicion that that was part of what was driving Penina. And they had come up with this for him to marry and have children. John Maxwell wrote a book, Wisdom from Wisdom in the Bible, and he ascribes to Rahab this phrase. Go throw it on the screen so you can be sure and see it. It says, don't complicate God's promise with your solution. Let that sink in. Happened over and over again in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah did that. Abraham's known as the father of faith. And he trusted God, but when the time went by and they weren't having the son, the child that they were promised, they took matters in their own hands. And they had him lay with Hagar. Hagar conceived, bore Ishmael. And to this day, we have the conflict, conflict between Israel and the tribes of Ishmael. So don't, don't complicate God's promise with your solution. Trust him. Wait on him. Elkanah was a faithful man. Every year he took his family to Shiloh to worship God at the temple. One particular time in our account in first chapter of Samuel says, Penina was just giving Hannah a real hard way to go. Just, just mean and ugly and had Hannah crying over it. After a meal, she went out to the steps of the temple and she's pouring her heart out to God. Says she's weeping bitterly. Heart is broken over this issue that she can't have a child. Eli, the priest at the time, is sitting there watching her. He thinks she's drunk. And so he admonishes her to give up the wine, to quit doing that. And Hannah defends herself and says, I, I've not been drinking. I am so torn and hurt in my spirit. I was crying out to God that he would give me a son. Eli relented from his admonishment and told her to go in peace and pray that may the God of Israel grant what you have asked him. Just that word of encouragement from the priest encouraged Hannah. It says she, her spirit lifted. She was downcast no more. And she went on about her way. Elkanah did love Hannah. He, he loved his wife. He continued to have intimate relations with her, even knowing she couldn't have children. That might have been a reason for him to stop, but he didn't. He loved her, wanted to be with her. He valued Hannah more than as just a woman to give him children. Verse 19 of 1 Samuel tells us the Lord did remember Hannah and opened her womb so she could bear children. Hannah is a great example of a woman of faith. She was real. She experienced pain and joy. She wanted to please her husband and give him his deepest desires. She took her troubles to the Lord, believing that he was a God who listens. And she was also a woman of her word. During her time of prayer, Hannah had come to a place of complete brokenness. Just saw no way out, was totally devastated, didn't know anything to do, couldn't change what her body was doing, pouring herself out with the Lord to where she did what we often do. She kind of made a bargain with God. God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And that's what she did. When God did bless her with a child, when it came time, the next time to go up to Shiloh, she told her husband Elkanah, I'm going to stay here, raise the child until he is weaned, and then I'll take him to the temple. And again, a sign of Elkanah's love and faith and trust in her. He said, you do what you know is right. And so we think for about three years, El Hannah stayed home, took care of Samuel, and raised him. But then when that time when he was done weaning, she kept her word. 
She took him back to the temple to leave him there. Now, you moms can really relate to that of how on earth she could do that. She'd waited years for this occasion, waited years for a son. And how could she go through with that? But she was that faithful of a person to fulfill her vow to the Lord. She knew she'd be going to see him uh, every year whenever they go to worship, but still it's not the same as having him in your home, is it? She was a person of her word. She reared Samuel. She raised him to be there in the temple. And when he was three to four years old, she brought him to Eli. She reminded Eli that she was the woman who had been crying bitterly that he thought was drunk and that he was now leaving him there for her. Hannah was a woman of deep faith who didn't turn away from her promise when her prayer was answered. The verses I read from chapter 2 was Hannah singing in praise about the goodness of God. Scriptures go on to tell us God continued to bless her as she had five more children, three sons and two daughters, a total of six children. Hannah is that shining example of a faithful mother, a faithful person, an example for all of us, men and women. In her, we see a faithfulness of our mothers who worked into the night to mend our clothes, to make sure we were ready to go to school the next day, to make sure food was ready, to take care of us when we slept. Hannah also teaches us some great truths about God. Through her story, we are assured that our God is a God who hears us. He hears our prayers. We also know that our God is a God who remembers us. That's a great line there where it says that Hannah went back, she and Elkanah lay together, and the Lord remembered her. That is a comfort for all of us that we can take as the Lord remembers you. He remembers what's on your heart. He remembers what's troubling you. He remembers what brings you joy. He remembers you, and he works to do the best in your life. We also learn from this that our God can turn the improbable into the possible. There was no hope in Hannah's heart that she could ever bear a child. But God can do anything. And he made that possible. Not just the one, but as I said, five more. So following Hannah's faith, following these lessons we can learn from her life, we can rest in our faith by embracing these truths from the life of Hannah. God does hear you. You may feel like he doesn't. We often say my prayers aren't going past the ceiling, but God hears each and every one, and he is working on your behalf. He remembers you. He remembers you when you pour out your heart to him, whenever you're struggling mightily. We want the answer right away. God knows when the answer's right. In this case, in this situation, what really, uh, there was more going on. Eli was priest. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that were priests. They were corrupt priests. They took food they weren't supposed to take that was sacrificed. They had wrong relationships with the women who were coming to worship. They were wicked, corrupt people. The people of God cried out to God for relief. And God sent that relief through the son Samuel, through the woman of faith, Hannah. Samuel became the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He's the one that coronated King Saul, the first king of Israel. He's the one that God led to David and crowned David as king of Israel, the greatest king they ever had. But it took time, even from the time he was born, when God provided this child, it took many years for him to come into the priesthood. 
but God heard the people's prayers. He provided an answer, and in the right time, it came. We can take stock in that, that that is our God. Isn't that a God we can trust who can turn the impossible into the possible? Isn't that a God we can serve, one who is watching out for our well-being when we don't even know it? If he isn't a God you can trust, worship, and serve, there's no one else. There is no other God who has loved you the way he has loved you. I'll remind you of what I've said in recent previous sermons to remember God loves you better than anyone else ever has or ever could, even your mother. God knows everything more than anyone else, including your past. He knows where you've been, where you've come from, and he knows your future. He sees it while we wonder about it. Since God loves you more than anyone else, since he knows better than anyone else, he is certainly the one we should yield our lives to. If you've not accepted that gift of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life, why not? Are you looking for a better God, a bigger God? Do you think you can come up with the answer, a better deal? You won't. So I encourage you to receive his gift even today. Yield your life to his way and you'll find that true joy like Hannah did. Christian, we profess that we've accepted Jesus as our Savior and Lord. But you know, we still hold out on him. We still keep some things in our grasp. We still refuse to release to him every part of our lives. Whether we just don't want to give up what we don't want to give up or whether we think we can do it better. Maybe in some foolish notion we think that I don't want to trouble God with this. I'll just hold on to it. God wants us to lay it all at his feet, to trust him for everything in our lives. When you hold out from God, you're not punishing him with your disobedience, but you do grieve him by holding him at arm's length. You aren't punishing him, but you're punishing yourself by not fully yielding your life to him. So we need to let go of our pride, let go of our greed, let go of our struggle for importance, give him our life completely. Let him then give back to us more than we could ask or think. Our mothers are mothers of women who loved us, who sacrificed mightily for us. They didn't do it because they enjoyed being sleepless, tired, worn out, hurting, needles sore from sewing. They did it so that you could have a wonderful life. And while in our impudence and arrogance we can think and focus on mistakes they may have made. They were doing their best out of their love so that you could have a wonderful life. They were exemplifying God to you. That's what God wants. Let's bow in prayer. Our most precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for Hannah, Lord. I thank you for your word. It was a very patriarchal society. Women were viewed differently than we come to view them now. But Lord, you've shown us the reality of life back then in your scripture. And you've shown us that though it was a hard life full of heartache, there were many who dedicated themselves to you, who believed in you, who trusted you, who served you, and who gave you all. Lord, our life can still be very hard. I don't want to go back to 3,000 years ago. I enjoy my house, my car, all those good things. I enjoy the air conditioning. 
But Lord, there's still tough times. We still have health issues. We still struggle financially. We still get hurt emotionally. But you're still there. You're still hearing. You're still remembering. You're still healing. So Lord, I ask that you would help us to trust you like Hannah did, to open our hearts to you, and to receive the blessing that you have in store for us, more than we can ask or think. So Father, on this Mother's Day, help us to remember those blessed memories of our mothers, whether they're gone or they're here now. Remember the times they nurtured us, rocked us, cared for us, spanked us, all for our good to help us become capable adults, to be an honor to them, our parents. So Father, we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.